I've already said hello and welcome to everybody here this morning. If you don't know me, my name's Mark. It's really good to, uh, to see you with us. And for those that are watching online, good to have you with us too, whether that's now or later in the week. Also really pleased to, uh, to welcome Ian this morning. Ian joins us from uh, all the way from Cheltenham. And we'll find out a little bit more about Ian in a while and hear God's word from him as well. Some verses from Psalm 95 as we come to worship together. So in Psalm 95, we read, Sing joyful songs to the Lord. Praise the mighty rock where we are safe. Come to worship him with thankful hearts and songs of praise. The Lord is the greatest God, king over all other gods. He holds the deepest part of the earth in his hands, and the mountain peaks also belong to him. The ocean is the Lord's because he made it, and with his own hands he formed the dry land. Bow down and worship the Lord our Creator. The Lord is our God, and we are his people, the sheep he takes care of in his own pasture. That's the God we're able to praise and to worship in this place together this morning. I'm going to encourage you, we're going to stand and share in a couple of songs. There's what I refer to as the joyful noisemakers down there. If anyone wants to grab one of those, there's flags, there's banners. Let's enjoy praising and worshipping our great God this morning.
Heavenly Father, we praise and we thank you that we can do that in this place this morning. We can glorify your name. With all that's going on around us, we're able to pause and to bring you our praise. And we thank you for that privilege. Amen. Do take your seat. Okay, so we've got Ian with us. I'm going to ask Ian if he'll join me up here, if that's all right. And having told him that there's a nice screen that he'll be able to see later on. Oh, it is there now. It wasn't on just now. Hello. So, Ian, good to see you. Nice to see you, yes. So, maybe first of all, I've given them a bit of a clue about Cheltenham and where yes. you've come from today, but have you always been in Cheltenham? Oh, no. Um only been in Cheltenham for the last, uh, well, since 2015. Prior to that, we've lived in um, the northeast of England, which might have a giveaway. Uh, we live in the north of East England, then we lived in Leicestershire, then we lived in Oxfordshire, then we lived in Monmouthshire, and now we're in Cheltenham, which is in Gloucestershire. Very good. And what is it that you've been doing in those places? Um, in the northeast of England, I worked in a coal mine. In Leicestershire, I worked for the Boys Brigade, um, developing the work of the Boys Brigade across the East Midlands. And then we went to Oxfordshire, where I um, worked for the Baptist Union as their youth advisor. And then we went from Oxfordshire to Bristol, where I worked at Bristol Baptist College, running uh, the Centre for Youth Ministry, a youth degree. And then we retired to Cheltenham, where for somebody else's wisdom, um, I became the pastor of a small Baptist church. A nice retirement. I didn't know what else to do. <laughs> and, um, and at the time, it sounded like a good idea. <laughs> History will tell whether at the end it was a good idea. Oh, fantastic. And, and is there something that we can remember for you in prayer, either like right, right now for, for the current situation or things that you're looking into? Well, I think the, um, the, the thing about Gas Green is, um, is that Gas Green is in, in a very similar setting to you and that we are on the corner of terraced housing and, um, and there's nowhere to park. We have no parking even though the kind lady put a bollard for a space for me, um, <laughs> I, I thought to myself, the best place to put the bollard for a visitor is on the edge. So they don't have to... Anyway, we're three miles down the road, you know, <laughs> where we found a space. And, and Gas Green is very similar to that. The other difference between you and Gas Green is that Gas Green has um, 20 members. And, and on a Sunday, where they are now, and they send their greetings where they are now, there'll probably be about 16, 17 people, um, three, of whom, three of whom are under 60. Right? I'll do a straw poll here, but we'll, we'll not embarrass you. And, uh, <laughs> so, so for us at Gas Green, the Sunday congregation is the least of our congregations. Our biggest congregation is the things that happen, like your notice board, the things that happen in the church and outside of the church through the week where we have about a congregation of about 90 doing various different things, but they don't come on Sundays. It's not a place where people come on Sundays. And so what I would pray for, ask you to pray for is pray for the continued engagement of Gas Green Baptist Church within the community. Um, we're not fighting to get people in on Sunday. We are fighting to get people in the week to talk about Jesus, where they are. And, and that, is, that is absolutely fantastic and very exciting. So pray for the mission of the church outside, not necessarily for the mission of the church inside, which would be very nice. You know, it would be lovely. It would be great. And as I stand here and sing, it would be great if we had kids. We've got two children who come and, uh, on a Sunday, and, and that's it. And, and so it warms my heart and Val's heart, my wife, to, to see the kids and to have the, the environment that you have here. But Gas Green doesn't have that. Um, but we do have a very exciting mission to the houses around our church. 
Excellent, Ian. Thank you very much. We'll you. pray for that as part of our prayer time in a while. Interest in retirement choices. There we go. Um, a few notices that uh, just to remind you of, there's a, there's a weekly sheet if you haven't got it on email already. Um, one, one that we'll also be praying about um, a bit later is that Meg has had a fall this week um, and she's ended up with a hip replacement and is in hospital at the moment. All right. So, um, yeah, she, she, I think the, the, the view was she wasn't skiving the hour of prayer yesterday. She was stuck in hospital. <laughs> so, bless her. So we'll remember Meg in our prayers a bit later on. Um, Abby, you have a notice for us as well. And then Pete. Hi, uh, morning everybody. Um, I just wanted to remind everybody um, about the home groups that we have in the church. Um, you might also know them as small groups or cell groups, but we tend to refer to them as home groups here because they happen in people's houses. Um, we've got about five home groups that run and they tend to go fortnightly, um, kind of all different areas over Swindon. Um, and they are fantastic. Uh, Matt and I host uh, one, and Lars and Mari lead our one. Um, we've been involved in home group for quite a lot of years now, actually. Um, but we love them. We're really passionate about them. Um, so I wanted to remind you that home groups happen in the church anyway, if you wanted to join them. But also during Lent, uh, we've decided to start up Lent home groups again. So this works a little bit differently. So for the period of Lent, which is about six weeks, it kind of starts kind of um, pancake day week, because I know everybody's gonna know pancake day. So it's gonna start pancake day week, whatever kind of, whenever the home groups have their day that they meet. And it's gonna run for six weeks until I think about like the 20th of March, I think. Six weeks. These Lent home groups are gonna run weekly. So it's a short term, but full burst of home groups. Um, so I just wanted to encourage anybody who uh, is not in a home group at all at the moment. This is a really great opportunity to kind of uh, go for one, get started, see what they're all about. You might think, oh gosh, yeah, weekly, but it's only for six weeks. Block it out in your diary, your calendar, on your phone. Um, it will be really, really worthwhile. Um, yes, they happen six weeks. Um, so if you're not in one at all, please make this kind of time to get started in one. Um, if you've been going to one for a while and your home group is actually quite big, have a think if you attend that home group, is it maybe time for you for six weeks to have a go at hosting a new one? Or could you lead one for six weeks, leading up until Easter? So I just want you to think about those things. Um, so I've got my dates. We're gonna be doing the same study for those six weeks, um, which is gonna be a really, really exciting one and just getting us really uh, looking back over Easter, uh, and the events of Jesus' life. It's going to be a really, really exciting study. So we're all going to do the same, uh, which is great. So I want to just read out some Bible verses um, because it's really good in the church to always refer back to the Bible as to why we're doing these things. Not just because I want to. I really enjoy home groups, but this is what the Bible says for us to do. So if you want to turn to your Bibles to have a look at these verses, you can, or look on your phones, or I can just read it out to you. The first one I want to read to you is um, Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 to 25. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Let me read you another verse from the Bible. Acts, chapter 2, verse 
chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they were willing they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. And I've got one more verse. This one is Acts chapter 5, verse 42. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. I just think those verses just sum up the importance of home groups um, and the benefit to us as well. So, Join a home group. Speak to Dave Mildon Hall after. He's going to be in kid zone, so he might be a little bit later down. But make time to speak to him today. Put your name down to him if you're just interested. We can work out logistics later of which home group or if you want to host or if you want to lead. Let him know that you're interested. Uh, get your phones out after the service. Block it out in your diary now. Make it priority. Let us be devoted. Let us be committed. Um, let us really dig deep in the lead up to Easter to learn more about Jesus. Um, I could go on, but Mark's standing now. So, um, <laughs> yeah, sorry. I'll do a notice another day as well. But yeah, Lent home groups, speak to Dave Mildenhall after. Don't put it off. They're really, really fantastic. Um, thank you. Thanks, Abby. Peter. <laughs> Thanks, Abby. Hi, good morning. Another opportunity of coming together, meeting together, will be tonight, half past six. It's the launch of our first praise and prayer evenings. It's for one hour, half past six to half past seven. You should have already received a copy of the prayer list. By email, if you've not opened your inbox, it came out to you on Friday night. So open your inbox. In there you will find the prayer items that we will be praying about. One of the items we will be praying about is home groups. Woohoo! It's amazing how things come together, isn't it? So, as I said in the weekly, there is so much to praise God for, but there's an awful lot to pray about. Tonight we'll be praying about our world, our nation, Swindon, Gorse Hill, and ourselves. And we'll be doing it in half an hour. I've given you 15 items. You break that down, that means over those 15 items you have two minutes to pray about. You need to come prepared. We won't be talking about it. We will be praying. We will be getting into small cluster groups and we will be, as it were, hitting the ground running, okay? I want to enthuse you. I want to enthuse you to come and praise God. I want you to enthuse you to pray as well. If you can't come, if you're sat there thinking, I'm not coming, sorry, I've got a thought for you. Please take... One of these weeklies, oh sorry, one of these prayer lists, sorry, from Nick and Celia. Sometime today, pray about one or two of the items. It might be at three o'clock. It might be at 10 o'clock. We can all be involved. True? Yes. Yes, Peter. So that's good. So I would encourage you, come tonight, one hour. Thanks very much, Mark. Thanks, Pete. We're going to uh, take our opportunity now to bring our offerings. And uh, it was out. Oh, it's up there. And children, the, the cow is, is ready this week as well. So uh, we're all okay with the cow. Thank you.
Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we have opportunity to give. We recognize the importance of that. And uh, whether that's been through these bags, whether it's been gifts that have dropped into the cow for the project the children are supporting, or whether it's something that happens bank to bank, we bring you these, our gifts, along with the many other gifts and talents that you shared with us. And Lord, we do that because we want to see your name glorified in this place, yes, but beyond it in so many different ways as well. And we thank you for the many examples we see of that in and through this fellowship. We pray too, Lord, for our children. And as Ian and, and Val would remind us, again, as we often do, we praise and we thank you for those children. We thank you for all they bring to us as a fellowship. And we ask that you would bless and encourage and challenge them as they go to their groups to learn more of you, to learn more of what it's like to have a relationship with you, not just here on a Sunday, but in everything that they face. We'd ask that you would bless those that have prepared to share and encourage our children this morning. We with them all, we pray in your precious name. Amen. Amen. For those that haven't already started going, children, time for the groups. All right. We're going to just pause and spend some time in prayer while the children make their way to their groups and some of the parents make their way back in. So let's just, um, let's just come before the Lord in prayer. As Pete's reminded us, that privilege we have um, to bring our thoughts, our petition, those things on our mind to the Lord. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, you call us to pray. You call us to lift those who are in authority over us. And this morning, again, we remember those who lead nations. In many respects, we don't always like what we see in the way in which many nations are led and we pray for your wisdom for those who lead the countries of this world for those who have elected to bring about war may you convict to bring about peace For our own country, Lord. Again, so many things that we struggle with. Would you strengthen those who lift your name up in the buildings of government, in the discussions that take place, in the outcomes that get passed? that as a nation we would again return to your simple, effective ways of life. For ourselves, Lord, we continue to lift up the ministerial vacancy that we're in. We do, as we prayed recently, we do praise and we thank you for the many different visiting speakers that actually this vacancy provides. And we thank you for the way in which we've been challenged, encouraged and blessed as a fellowship through those speakers. We 
pray for, for Ian and Varel this morning, for Ian as he brings your word to us in a while. For that potted history that has seen them in so many places, seeking to glorify your name. And for the willingness, Lord, to continue to use the gifts that you've given to glorify those at Gas Green. And we would pray, Lord, that their mission beyond Sunday would continue to grow. That those that are already involved, those that already receive a welcome, those that are able to find out more about you, within a context that they're comfortable in during the week. Lord, continue to build that work. We pray for that fellowship, for the challenging age profile. But Lord, we thank you for the, for the wisdom and the insight to seek first to make you known wherever it's relevant. Bless them, we pray. Lord, we lift Meg up before you this morning in hospital recovering. And if we know Meg, no doubt sharing and chatting to as many people as she can as she seeks to be a witness for you in that place. But Lord, strengthen and protect her, we pray. Give her the recovery she needs. Give her the rest that she needs. That she would come back to us fit and able and ready. As, as again, we know Meg, ready to serve. Lord, we pray for the funerals this week, that in both cases they would be opportunities to recognize, to remember, to rejoice in an individual's life, but in, in individuals that have meant something to many people. And above and beyond all, Lord, that they would both be opportunities to provide witness of your immense love and grace. And finally, Lord, again, we lift up our children, the children of this fellowship. Lord, it's so great to see them and to hear them. Such varied characters all with their own different needs, abilities, and gifts. May we always be ready to encourage that variety, those gifts, as they, in turn, often without even knowing it, bring us such a blessing. You are a mighty God. Yet you choose to hear our prayers and we praise and we thank you for that and trust in your amazing timing as you provide us with answers to those prayers. We ask all these things in your precious name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to share together in a couple of songs before Ian comes to read God's word and share with us and I encourage you to just feel free to stand to sit but let's sing together
Father, we again just praise and thank you. You give us so much. Your promises remind us you never leave us. Whatever it is we face today, whatever we step into this week, you never leave us. Thank you, Father God. Lord, again, we would just lift Ian up before you as he comes to read from your word and to share what you've given him for us this morning. May we have hearts ready to ready to feel your presence through those words. May we be ready to listen and to respond. In your precious name. Amen. Amen. Ian, thank you. Thank you for the welcome. It's lovely to be here. And as I say, I bring the greetings of Gas Green, who, um, who are a bit behind you because they, they start at quarter to 11. So, so they're just a bit behind, but they could end up ahead of you. All right. And, uh, and, and you never can tell. Um, it's lovely to come. And I do pray that God will richly bless you in this period of seeking God's blessing upon you of a new minister. It's, it's one of those things that you sometimes look forward to and then by the end you dread it. And you think, oh my word. But I do wish you God's richest blessing as you seek the person that's going to um, lead you in, in the future. I'm going to read you something. And then I'm, uh, Mark's going to play. And... Um, and he's going to play for a few minutes. And I just want you to meditate on some of the things that I say. Who would you not want to see succeed? Or maybe more to the point, who would you like to see fail, see defeated? Who would you like to see God smite? Of late, as political campaigns ramped up, the airways have been filled with pundits and politicians waxing eloquent on who they'd like to see fail. He's dangerous. She embodies failed leadership. He doesn't get it. Such statements are lobbed from both ends of the political, political spectrum at the other person. But there are, of course, more insidious things going on even than politics. Which dictator could be best ousted or taken out by special forces? Which group of people are becoming more and more dangerous to our society at large and must be relegated to the back of the bus? Which company needs to be outmaneuvered so that my company can succeed and I can keep my job? This is the moral soup in which Jonah swims.
Loving God, may your Holy Spirit speak to each one of us. May that Spirit remind us that each one of us has prejudices of one kind or another. Each one of us has the capacity to prejudge the other. And we ask this morning, O loving God, that as we look at Jonah, so your Spirit will speak into our hearts. And like with Jonah, we might turn around and say thank you, God, for your eternal blessing in our lives. Amen. We're going to read from the book of Jonah, the back end of the book of Jonah, in a minute. Ooh. Jonah 4, 1 to 11. But Jonah was greatly displeased and became angry. He prayed to the Lord, O oh Lord, is this not what I said when I was still at home? That is why I was so quick to flee to Tarshish. I knew, I knew that you are a gracious and a compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love. A God who relents from sending calamity. Now, O oh Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, Have you any right to be angry, Jonah? And Jonah went out and sat down at a place east of the city. And there he made himself a shelter and sat in its shade and waited to see what would happen to the city of Nineveh. Then the Lord provided a vine and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head, to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the vine. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the vine so that it withered. And when the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die, he said. It would be better for me to die than to live, but God said to Jonah, do you have a right to be angry about the vine? I do, he said. I am angry enough to die. But the Lord said, You have been concerned about this vine. Though you did not tend it, you did not make it grow, it sprang up overnight and died overnight. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and many cattle as well. Should I not be concerned about that great city? Amen. Gosh. This is a rhetorical question. When was the last time you read the story of Jonah? And when was the last time you even thought of Jonah other than in relation to a whale. The whale, just in case you're wondering, will get very short shrift this morning. So don't think, where's the whale? Where's the whale? All right. Have you ever thought of yourself, if so-and-so could be a bit different, I could like them. If so-and-so was just a little bit different, I would like them. You know, if so-and-so didn't pick their nose in public, I think I could like them. Or, if the world was full of people like you and me, well, wouldn't it be a lovely place? It would be just, it would be righteous, it would be a wonderful place. Indeed, if Jonah, as we are led to believe, was a staunch man of religious belief and very devout, would you get on with him? If somebody said to you, 
and I know your humility would prevent you from answering this in the positive, right? If somebody said to you, are you a devout follower of the Lord Jesus Christ? How many of you would just put your hand up and say, yep, I claim that? And how many of you would go, well, I wouldn't like to say I was a, a deep, you know, I would, you would. So how many of you, now is not a time to be humble. How many of you are a devout believer that the Lord Jesus Christ is the reason for who you are and what you are called to do? You can put your hand up. How many of you, it's all right, you don't have to if you don't want to. How many of you are thinking about it? Ooh. Ooh. You know, thinking about it? Jonah was a man who was devout. But he was devout to the point that he wanted a God in his own image. Yeah. You, know, you want your children, those of you who've got children, those of you who have children, right? Blah, blah, blah. You would love them to grow up in your own image, wouldn't you? You look at yourself and you think to yourself, now, if my son grew up like me, wouldn't he be lovely? If my daughter grew up like me, you would go, oh, the world will be saved. But sadly, history tells me, not a dog's chance, mate. <laughs> they seem to grow up often diametrically opposite to you until they come to an age when you go, actually, they're quite nice, aren't they? They've grown up quite nice. Jonah was a man who had a problem. God <clears throat> simply, he says, a God who simply smites bad people and blesses good people. That's what Jonah wanted. So God comes to Jonah and says to Jonah, hello, uh, uh, do you mind I'm going to use you just as a, you know, have you got a name? Roger. Roger. Right. So God comes to Roger and he says to Roger, Roger. And you go, yes, Lord. He says, Roger, what I want you to do is I want you to go into um, the center, wherever that is in Swindon, on Saturday morning at 10 o'clock, stand up and shout to the people of Swindon, the Lord says, renounce your sin and you will be saved. What are the chances that you might be found somewhere else at 10 o'clock on Saturday morning. What are the chances? Pretty high, aren't they? Pretty high. Even if you didn't have to, you would find a reason. I've got to go and visit the dog, right? God says to Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh and tell the people that unless they renounce their sin, now, Jonah knows Nineveh. Nineveh was somewhere around about, so I think I remember, around about the south bit of Iraq, right? And the Nineveh, the people of Nineveh, were amongst the most violent, the most repulsive people. They, they committed horrendous, absolutely horrendous things to the people that they overtook and the people they took prisoner. They were absolutely insane. So Jonah thinks, stupid idea, stupid idea, I'm not going there. So he gets in his boat and he goes off. Jonah's problem was that he could not understand, and sometimes I can't either, understand a God who can both love you and punish you. Because those of you those who are experienced, or those who have been parents, you don't have to be experienced, know that it's very difficult sometimes to love your children. They do things that drive you absolutely up the pole, across the ceiling, down the other side, and you go, you're still here. <laughs> I don't know where to go, Daddy. I don't care! Jonah had this problem. He had the problem that... He could see himself, but what he couldn't understand was how the mercy of God works. Why would God care about the people of Nineveh? Why would he? Because, if I may speak broadly, there are people here 
who don't care about people who live next door to them because you ask the question, why should I? They're an absolute pain in the brain. Why should I, Roger, stand in the marketplace or wherever there is in Swindon on Saturday morning, half past ten, and say, the Lord says, renounce your sin or you will be destroyed. He says, why should I? Why should I? They don't deserve it. And then you ask the question, what do they not deserve? Do they not deserve God's blessing? That's the question. So this is the world in which Jonah was inhabiting. This is how Jonah thinks. He can't understand God. And you think to yourself, well, he's not the first person to not understand God. The book of Jonah, in the minds of many people, is simply about a man. Jonah disappearing God, being swallowed by a whale, and spewed upon a beach where he should have gone in the first place. Yeah. Now you could say that, that my life is not dissimilar to Jonah. In 1970-ish, somewhere around about that, if you're too young, don't worry about it. The world was much the same as it is now, right? In 1970-ish, I, um, I applied to, Bristol, to um, Spurgeon's College to go and train as a minister. Um, I, missed a, I missed an appointment, and which meant that I, I couldn't go, so I didn't go. I did those other things that I've told you about earlier, right? So he waits, he waits until the guy is... 67, and then he says, how about having a church? And you go, I thought I got over that. So here we are. Here we are in this place. The great fish, this is the only reference you'll get to the fish, has probably made Jonah the most famous story in the Bible and the most famous of the 12 minor prophets in the Old Testament. And hopefully, we'll know something else before we get to the end. The other thing about Jonah is that there are only 48 verses in the book of Jonah. And to everybody I've spoken to, that comes as a surprise. Only 48 verses. Hardly worth it. And Roger is refusing to say five. He's refusing to go and say five. And he thinks, oh, gosh, I wish I'd never sat here. So how many of us see the book of Jonah as one story, and how many of us see the book of Jonah as two stories? You see, the book of Jonah is not just about a man and a fish in Nineveh. The story is chapter 1 and chapter 2, and chapter 3 and chapter 4. They are two different stories. And you ask yourself, what are the stories? So the first one is simply a fable of a man who, um, who is swallowed by a whale and is spewed up on a beach. And the second one are the commands given by God which are this time carried out. So have you ever been in a position where you've been asked to do something and you've gone, no? And, and somebody's looked at you and gone, no. Did you say no? And you say, yes, I said no. And they go, no. So if not you, who? If, if, if not you, who? And, and Roger, bless him, says, Harry. He's much better at speaking like than me. And you go, Harry. Harry, you're Harry, right? Harry, you've got to be in the marketplace on Saturday morning at 10.30 to tell the people of, it, of Swindon, blah, blah, blah. Right? And Harry goes, not me. So today, are you the not me? Are you the not me? So the lady stood here this morning eloquently preaching about the value of home groups. And that valent. I'm not going to be as long as her, because I could never be as long as her. Right. <laughs> the value of home groups. And, and she's pleading with you to go, six weeks, she says. It's only six weeks. And you're going, 
It might as well be two. I'm not coming. Here we have Jonah. And the book of Jonah, you see, expresses so much about God. And the thing about Jonah is that God is expressing his love for societies beyond, to use our language, beyond the church. Beyond the church. He's taking Roger out of the church. He's not having Roger stand up on a Sunday morning and say to you, now then, repent of your sins, blah, blah, blah. He's taking this man out of his context into another context in order to show this man that God loves the world that he created. God did not just create you and me. He created the man down the street who doesn't give a tuppence about Gorse, Green, ba Gorse Hill Baptist Church. Doesn't give tuppence about the God you profess to worship. But what he does care about, he cares about the world in which he lives. And God is saying to Jonah, Jonah, I want you to go to my people. I created them. God created the guy down the road, three miles where we parked, right? He, he loves him. And the guy who looked at us as we went along the road said, who are you? He loves them. And the question was to Jonah, go to Nineveh, because I love them. Go to wherever is around here. I love them. And I love you too, he says. So Joah finds God an enigma, a person difficult to understand. Forgive me. Because he can't reconcile the mercy of God with his justice. Why would God want to redeem a group of people who are the most savage of savages at the time? Why would he? And we come to the answer at the end. You see, you and I ask the same questions. How can God love Vladimir Putin? So how many would go to Moscow? Hello, Vladimir. I've come because God has told me to tell you, repent of your sins or you will be destroyed. And Vladimir says, bang. How many of you and I put this name in because I thought some of you might be of a generation to remember this person. How many of you think that God loved Margaret Thatcher? Right? Strange as it may seem, God loved Margaret Thatcher in the same way he loves Vladimir Putin. Equally, Adolf Hitler, Boris Johnson, Liz Truss, Jeremy Corbyn, Elon Musk, Donald Trump, and the list goes on and on and on. God loves each one of them as much as he loves you. And you go, oh, no, he didn't. He can't, surely. And God says, whoever you are, you're Jonah. You're Jonah. And I want you to go into the world and tell them that I love them. And you go, oh, no, Mark can do that. He's good at that, right? Roger will learn to do it. And Harry, well, he's thinking about it. Forgive me for not mentioning any women's names, but I'll come to them shortly. <laughs> and I any other person. How can God be merciful and just? How can he? You think to yourself, Vladimir Putin, this is a straw poll. How many of you think Vladimir Putin should be put against the wall and shot? You see, you're frightened to say yes. Some of you aren't, right? But on the main, we're frightened to say yes because we think to ourselves, we should love him. But I don't. We should love him. The question arises, how can God be merciful and just? And the book doesn't answer it, but teaches us to look to the one who called himself the ultimate Jonah. And the ultimate Jonah we find in Matthew 21, 41 is Jesus. Jesus is the ultimate Jonah. Jesus is the one who God sent to the world to tell them that they need to change their ways and to for, for, be forgiven in order that they might be reunited with their God. Jesus came that you and I might have life. And, and when he gave you life, he says, I now want you to go and tell your neighbor that they can have life through Jesus. And you go, have you met my neighbor? 
And Jesus says, I created your neighbor. And you go, well, he did a bad job. <laughs> God says, make a cake. Make a cake and take it to your neighbor and says, every blessing. And they go, oh, oh. All right, thank you. Put it in their pocket. He did. The next time you see them, you give them a cake. Have a cake. And they go, what do you want? And you say, I don't want anything. What I'm doing is I'm trying to share with you the love of God in the easiest way that I know possible. Every time I give you a cake, Jesus loves you. And they go, fishy. No, not a fish cake. It's a cake. But then, then we come to Romans. And Romans, when we look at Romans, in Romans 3.26, what we read is that justifies those who believe. So if you believe, you will be justified. If you believe and go to the marketplace on Saturday morning, tap us ten, you will be justified. You might be embarrassed, but who has not suffered a bit of embarrassment in their life? Embarrassment in itself doesn't kill you. It might make you feel a bit sad, but it doesn't kill you. And what we have to ask ourselves is only when we fully grasp the gospel will we, uh, will we neither be cruel exploiters like the Ninevites nor pharisaical believers. When Jesus comes into our lives, we stop being pharisaical and we stop being beaters like Nineveh. We become people filled with the Spirit of God and transformed to the people that God wants us to be. And you think to yourself, I've heard that story loads of times. The question is, does, do you believe it? Do you believe that you are not the person you were, but you are the person that Jesus wants you to be? Jonah couldn't understand it. Jonah couldn't get his head around the idea that if, 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 if God loves me. He couldn't get his head around it. And you're asking yourself, oh, why should I? See, Jonah, in the first instance, did what most of us do. So let's just assume we are promoting him on his heritage, right? Just as you, Mark is the pastor of the church. Father, I did not lay my hands upon him, right? right. So Mark is the pastor of your church. And he comes to you and he says, Roger. And you go, no, I'm not again. <laughs> and he says, Roger, I just want you to go and do this little job for me. That man or that woman that you're sending me to, sacked me last week. I know, and that's why I'm sending you. And when you go, say to them, I forgive you, I love you in Jesus, and all will be well. Amen. And you go, or Roger goes. No. What does Mark do? What does Mark do? Mark just has to hold his ground and say, Roger, you're the person who needs to go to that person. And Roger's like, oh, do you know what they did to me? And you go, yes, I do. Do you know what it'll cost me to go through that door? Yes, I do. So why not ask somebody else? Because you're the only one who can go. And that's with Jonah. Jonah is called by God because Jonah is the man that God has called to do the job. Now, when he goes to Nineveh the second time, the second time, lo and behold, what happens? He tells the people, and what do they do? They immediately, the king immediately says, sackcloth and ashes, Sackcloth and ashes. Forgive, we repent. And Jonah is absolutely livid. Absolutely livid. And you go, what? Why? How can you do it? And God goes, because I'm God. And you go, oh. And when this guy goes to see this person, he says, 
They say, why have you come? And he said, I've come because the Lord Jesus Christ has sent me. He has sent me to save the wretched and to forgive the sins. That's why he sent me. And you think, oh my word. Wow, that's powerful stuff. Powerful stuff. So at this point, I just want you to pause and have a lateral thought. Now you might think we've had enough lateral thoughts this morning. To a lateral thought. Where have you heard this story before? Where have you heard this story before? Somebody goes away, comes back. Where have you heard the story before? Well, if you go to Luke's Gospel, chapter 15, and listen to the story of the prodigal son, well done, have an extra biscuit, you will read the same story, the same story, and you go, well, I never did. It never crossed my mind that Jonah and the prodigal son was the same story. And you go, two for one. Very topical, isn't it? Two for one. And you think to yourself, oh my word. So half of the book, Jonah is like the older brother. He is scolding God. <laughs> and God's going, it's okay. It's okay. The parable ends with the question from the father to the pharisaical son. This brother of yours was dead, but is alive again. Lost and now is found. So, just as the book ends, 120,000 people, God says to Jonah, should I not be concerned for them? You know the story about the lost sheep? One sheep, I will put the 99 in the, in the, the hold, and I'll go and look for the one. God created every person that we see here or out there. Therefore, God says, I love them as much as I love you. Go you into the world and preach the gospel that others might come to me and there be great rejoicing in heaven. Let's just be quiet for a second. Loving God, we just say thank you. We say thank you for the fact that we talk in different languages and we talk in different ways, but the message is still the same. The message is that you call us to go out into the world to preach the good news of Jesus Christ, that others might come to know him. Amen. We're going to sing, Abide With Me. And... Uh, and I'm in two minds in my heart. I'm not sure if this abide with me and the abide with me that's in thy head is the same abide with me. Probably not, which is a blessing. So anyway, we'll sing. Thank you.
Beautiful, thank you. Can we share in a, in a benediction together? Holy Spirit, sorry, I thought it was going to be on the screen. I'll read it to you. Okay. Holy Spirit, when we cannot part the weeds of our own traditions and old languages, when the old pathways of prayer feel choked with briars and thorns, would you make a path in the wilderness for us to find you in new ways, new words, new practices, new permissions? Would you meet us in the wilderness and set out a feast? We are hungry and thirsty. May we learn to sit with you in silence and know it is enough to know you and be known by you and know ourselves. Amen.